Hi, everyone. So my name is Tamara, and I am a visual artist. I paint, and my exploration in the studio is about our awareness of spirit moving in the world, and particularly with a reverence for the natural world as I'm exploring that. So I wanted to start with a story. Um, I was wanting to pursue my career as an artist and decided to go back to school to do that. And so I was in my first week back at art school and I'd been out of school for a while and it was this whole new adventure. And the first week was very uncomfortable as I was re-entering this world of being a student and oh my gosh, what am I doing? What have I done? So then it was the beginning of the second week and I remember thinking, okay, this week's gonna be different. I'm gonna be enjoying this more. I'm getting to know the campus. I'm learning my way around. Um, I think I'm ready to do this in a calmer way. And then that morning, um, I got up and started getting ready for school, and it was September 11, 2001. So I got to school. Um, the professor of my first class was from New York, had a bunch of friends there, and he just said, I, I can't teach. I'm too distraught and dismissed the class. So we left the class and wandered around kind of in this shock. And then it was time for my next class, which is uh, this visual elements. We were doing some hands-on projects in that class. Walk into the class and the professor said, we know what's going on. This is a very strange time. I mean, we, we don't, we have yet to know how this is gonna play out. We're all kind of in this strange place. And the best thing that we can do right now is to do, do our work, to get down and do this project. And that's what we did. And it showed me so clearly how much making, how much the act of making can be a refuge, can be a place of solace, can really nourish our deep beings. And I, I just, it, I was so grateful to have something to move into to do that. So, Got my degree, started making art full time. That's now what I do. I show in galleries around the country, um, London as well. And um, I'm very grateful to get to do this work. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about my path as an artist and what my work is about. Because to me, both the act of making it is an exploration that's about solace, that's a comfort and consolation in challenging times, and it's also what has a lot of meaning for me, and it's something that I like to offer out to others so that maybe they can find a sense of calm and a place of stillness in looking at the work. It, there's a gift in looking at the work. That's the, the hope. Um, yes? Is it? Is it your hair? Oh, thank you for letting me know. Good, I will change that. Thank you. All right, let's see how that does. Okay, is that better? Like the thunderstorm's over? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so there's, there's three threats throughout my life that have been places that I keep coming back to. So one is the natural world. Um, where I grew up in New England um, and part of the time in Berlin, um, my family and I, we were always going to the woods or the ocean. There was this ongoing love of beauty and nature and the wonder of nature. And um, did a lot of traveling as well, so I got to see a lot of places around the world and experience the beauty of those places as well. The, uh, another thread is making itself, art making. So I've done that um, uh, since I was a kid, drawing was kind of my way to play when I was a kid. I was also doing a lot of crafts. Um, as I moved into high school and college, I was doing ceramics and jewelry making. and So I've always had this love of making and curiosity about not only what can we can make, also the act of making itself. And then the third thread is it's very much about this idea of how to live a life of meaning alongside what, what spirituality is, what that means to me. You know, as I said, my work is very much about awareness of the presence of the divine in life. And that's, that's a really personal conversation for each of us. So 
it's not so much about a name or a belief system or it's got to look or be this certain way. It's what are the questions that we ask ourselves and, and then also, you know, how is that made practical in life? Like, we're not just going to sit in the cave and meditate. It's like, how do we bring that into the world in a real way? Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about my work with, alongside that. Um, So the paintings themselves, I'm thinking about this idea of interior space. So it's, it's like when I let go of what's going on around me and go inside, what is it that I find there? So this idea of living with meaning isn't so much about what I'm going to do in the world around me, although it does translate to that. It's what is, what's this, what is my soul called to? Like what is, if I'm really in a place of quiet and answering beyond thinking and feeling, that part of ourselves that we only reach when we're in a place of stillness, what is calling to me from there? So one way of looking at that is, is, is a sense of life mission. Um, not like a um, religious mission, but like I mean, what's the mission I was sent on? Like each of us, if we have that, which I believe we do, then what is the call that is deeply within me for me to find and pursue? And then to bring that into my work in the world and get to share that. Um, so that takes me very quickly to this idea of this is a spiritual conversation. This is something that's, you know, some people might say a soul conversation. There's different words. Um, I got really curious about this word spirituality and because it, it kind of feels a little floppy to me as a word. It's like, what do you mean? Like, is that meditation or what are you talking about? So I did a little research about that. And I, it was so interesting what I found because there's some studies where people have said, oh, there's, there's a dozen different, different thorough and complete definitions of spirituality. It's like, okay. Yeah. And then there was another one that said there's like 27 different definitions of what spirituality is. And I mean, really, I think t we're each going to have our own relationship with whatever that word means to us, um, which I think there's a lot of freedom in getting to honor that within ourselves and have that question brewing inside us so that it's not just, a, oh, whatever, it's this other thing. It's like, what am I, what am I really curious about when that, that word comes up? Um, I like how Ken Wilber is a, a transpersonal psychologist, um, Buddhist, and writes about this theory of living it's integral. He, calls it integral theory, which is kind of being able to bring all the parts of self together and move forward from there. Um, so he talks about, there's, there's about a few different definitions that he sees as, especially in our culture that are, that are happening, that are what spirituality is. So one is it's having a certain attitude. So, so if somebody's having an attitude of being compassionate, that's being spiritual within that definition. And then another one is being in an altered, an altered state. That's another one that gets used a lot. Uh, another one is a peak experience. You know, somebody saying, oh, I've had a religious experience. You know? um, and then another one is, it's a line of development. So it's, say, it's like somebody saying they're gonna develop their, their particular like, deep self intelligence. Like we have, our intellect that we can develop, we can develop physical, you know, spatial intelligence, and this is another way to develop intelligence on a different level. So I like that idea of in the, a line of development because to me that goes alongside this idea of, you might say, practical spirituality, like having life mission, life purpose, like front and center, so that as I'm developing, as I'm pursuing these different threads that come up, you know, what arises from, let's like, say, the truth of my being, what, what am I doing with that? What do I choose to do? Um, which in my case is, is making, making art. So, show you a little bit about what I do in my studio. So this is work from 2008 and this particular series, I was really curious about this idea of how an idea itself goes from imagination to 
manifestation. So especially when it's something that, that's physically made, it's like somebody gets this idea like, oh, I'm going to build this thing. <laughs> and then it's, it's, um, there's the blueprints, there's the plans, there's how somebody approaches it, there's the problems that come up and how somebody overcomes those problems, you know, kind of engineering things. And eventually, it becomes manifest in the world. And as I was researching this body of work, I was thinking a lot about gardens. And there's um, a few different poets I found that were talking about this idea of the inner life as a garden. So how do I cultivate my inner life? How do I cultivate my garden? Is it bearing fruit? What's the fragrance of the perfume of my personality? Um, and so I was looking at botanicals and thinking about how amazing gardens are if if there's this patch of dirt and seeds and somebody puts their, their attention to it and waters it, these things that happen in that space, it's amazing. So that was that particular body of work. Um, and then I got to thinking, I, I went, to, um, went to Turkey and being there, I was made really aware of the different patterns that show up both in the textiles and then in the tile work, and how rhythmic and how, how musical these patterns are. So I started thinking about this idea of what are those about? Like, why are those there? I mean, you walk into a place like the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, and it's this beautiful, glorious, majestic structure, and then there's all these beautiful patterns all over the walls. And I'm like, they're not just covering empty space there. There's a reason those are there. And as I was reflecting on that, I was like, it, it, it brings me to a certain state. It kind of stops the mind chatter. It kind of stops my world. And I could calm down and, just, and really be present. And then because it is a place of worship, it's a mosque. So that space that got created, I could have a different kind of conversation with the, d the divine of my understanding. And I thought that was pretty cool. So um, as I was doing this work with patterns, I also started looking at this idea of what is moving through one's inner landscape. So like as I'm developing as a person, as I'm giving attention to particular qualities, like ideals, and we were talking about compassion earlier, you know, if that's present, what is that, if that's a being that's moving through my landscape, what might, that, what might that look like? And that brought me to this work of doing these kind of vertical beings that they kept showing up in my work for a couple years. Um, this particular body of work, these were in response to the idea that um, it shows up in a lot of traditions, this idea that we have, there are different times of days, times of the day that people go to contemplative practice. So in Christianity, there's a book of hours. So there's, these, there's like usually eight to 12 kind of offices where people will, it would still happens, but traditionally, medieval times especially, was when these physical books started showing up that had the times of day with particular kind of prayers or contemplations. Um, and Islam, of course, has the five times a day prayer. So these, this body of work was looking at this idea of there's times a day when there's going to be time to stop and go within and contemplate. And then I kept going with this idea of these beings. And I was using imagery directly from Christian illuminated manuscripts, European, usually 15th century Belgian manuscripts, and Persian textiles and tile work, and Indian textiles and tile work, northern Indian. And then um, some other things thrown in there that I would just encounter along the way, like contemporary artists and different palettes from different places. So I was noticing they kept getting more and more elaborate. And that was kind of an interesting thing to notice, because I was also I was looking at this idea of, of beauty. Like you know, William Morris, Arts and Crafts Movement founder, he'll talk about you know, not having anything in your house you do not find useful or beautiful. And so I was really thinking with this body of work of what it means to be, what, what is beauty? Like what is the role of beauty and how is it serving in my life? And then as an artist, you know, for a while it was a very unpopular word to say. 
in contemporary art. Um, when I started art school, you know, I was like, I want to do my thesis on beauty. And there were teachers that were like, you what? No, you can't do that. <laughs> we're not allowed to talk about beauty. And that's, luckily, that's changed since I started doing art full time, which is a good thing to see that happen. Um, and I really, I was just really curious about what beauty offers. There's, there's actually been, there have been studies done that there's particular, I think it's hydrogen, there's a nourishing aspect to our physical being when we encounter something beautiful, which I think is pretty cool. And it's actually nourishing on a lot of different levels. So, um, as I was doing this work, I was also looking at how I approached my work itself. And you know, as I was doing research for this talk, I was re, um, revisiting some of the things that I've thought over the years and practices that I've developed and been introduced to through classes I've done. And it was really strange because there was this kind of duality that was going on. There was one place where this idea of being in flow and being in that deep self so that there's no figuring it out, there's no mental, this is what I need to do next. There's, there's a place of, it's almost like a surrender and then a willingness to meet what comes up with that. And then on the other side of that duality is this place of, okay, the best way to develop skill to really go somewhere new and become a more skilled artist is to get uncomfortable and be at the edge of my abilities and then have certain ways of engaging with my art practice, which I'm gonna go into a little bit. So it was like these two places, and I've talked to some of my mentors about that, and like the best, to me, the best studio practice has both of them, where there's the, this is time for the just painting and seeing what comes up. It's like a co-conversation with the universe, would be one way to say it. And then on the other side, there's also, okay, well, I really wanna develop this certain kind of skill, so how do I go about that? And then doing a, skill development, deep practice, which I'll go into a little bit. And so kind of going between those two throughout my day working in the studio, and that seems to be the happy medium of producing work that really has merit. You know, that's, so, and not just producing the work, interestingly enough, it's also how I am as an artist. You know what I mean? Like the, the way that I am as an artist. So even before anything is produced on the easel, there's a way that I'm showing up to, to my work. So there's a John Cage quote that kind of perfectly talks about flow. Um, you guys know who John, John Cage is, you're familiar? So he, he was a composer, writer, philosopher with a very um, strong Buddhist sensibility. And he would do things like um, compose a piece that was like four minutes and 33 seconds and it was nobody doing anything, just silence, and it was about the power of silence. So this quote is, um, when you start working, everyone is in your studio. The past, your friends, enemies, the art world, and above all, your own ideas. All are there. But as you continue painting, they start leaving, one by one, and you are left completely alone. Then, if you are lucky, even you leave kind of perfectly describes flow. So um, I want to share a little bit about what flow is. And I realized as I was researching this that flow, like to describe how to get to flow, it's, it's like talking about spirituality. It's a very personal place to be. And it's, I think we each find our own way to encounter that. So here's some indicators of how, wh or how you know you're in flow. Usually I'll know because when I'm painting, if I have a CD on, suddenly the CD's done and it seems like no time went by. And, and I look and there's like all this stuff on the canvas that wasn't there and it's like, it is, it's like I left. Like not in a out of the body escape thing, but as a like spirit was, in, was doing the work. I was just holding the paintbrush. So flow itself, is the zone is another term for it. Um, it's a mental state of operation. Oh, this is from Mahali Csikszentmihalyi, um, Czech uh, psychologist. So it's a mental state of operation in which the person performing activity is fully immersed. There's a, there's a total immersion in the work itself. 
There's a feeling of energized focus, full involvement, of enjoyment in the process of the activity. So that complete absorp absorption in, in what one's doing and it results in a loss of one's sense of space and time. So it's like the sense of being outside time, like linear time just falls away. Um, the factors that encompass the experience of flow are intense focus, concentration in the present moment. Um, this one was really interesting. Emerging of action and awareness. And I would say that it's an awareness that comes from, it's not that mind figuring it out puzzle solving place, it's a different kind of awareness. A loss of reflective self-consciousness, a sense of personal control or agency over a situation or activity, distortion of temporal experience, um, again that's the being outside of time idea, the experience of the activity as intrinsically rewarding, so there's a sense of meaning and purpose that comes with doing the work and then um, also a sense of confidence. So I found that kind of interesting because if, it, if there's a confidence involved, then it's a different place than that skill building place that's over here that's more about letting go of that idea of confidence or no confidence and just and living at the, one the edge of one's ability. And I'll go more into that in a little while. Um, I thought it was really interesting that there's, um, in Buddhism and Taoism, there's mentions of states of mind that are very much about flow. So they talk, they both have references to the action of inaction. So again, it's that sense of surrender and also the doing without doing, um, that sense of surrender as well. So then there's this other place over here that's about um, skill development. Uh, I find skill development really interesting. I don't think it gets talked about very much among visual artists. Um, I think there's always new things to learn as an artist. I just met an artist in um, San Miguel, Mexico last year and he'd been painting for over 50 years and he said he still steps up to the easel and he has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> um, so I like being in a domain where there's always going to be new things to learn as, as a painter. So. So here's one way to look at skill development. This is from a book called The Talent Code, the Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. So he has this idea of deep practice. He went to all these kind of talent hotbeds around the world where they were, there were all these stars in the making, like a tennis camp, and they kept turning out all these world-class tennis players. So he's like, what's going on here? So this book um, was what came out of that exploration. So this is a really great book for skill development. So, so, he start, so what he's talking about is there's the neuron level that skill is happening, is being built on. So this, it's this idea that there's, there's a particular substance that winds around our neurons called myelin. And myelin, if it's, if it's built up, it helps the circuits fire quicker and faster. So as we're learning these skills, as we're in this place of uncomfortableness, we're actually building the insulation that goes around the neurons so that things are happening faster. So it's like we get to become, we go from consciously incompetent to consciously competent to unconsciously competent. It just, we just know what we're doing. We just know how to do it. So that just requires a little bit of that place of discomfort. So, when we fire our circuits in the right way, our myelin responds by wrapping the layers of insulation around the neural circuit, and with each new layer that's added, we're developing more skill and more speed. So if we're willing to, uh, and what I mean when I say operating at the edge of one's ability, basically is willing to make mistakes. <laughs> so it's like that place of, um, which may not be, uncomfortable for everyone. Um, I think there's, there's just a lot to be said for learning how to gracefully make mistakes because that's where the growth edge, that's where a lot of learning can happen and it's, um, it's a pretty powerful place to be. It's the optimal gap between what you know and what you were trying to do. So it's, it's choosing to go beyond, I know what I'm doing. I had actually about a year and a half in the studio where I felt really I reached this place of comfort with the paintings I was doing. I liked them. 
before they left the studio, I was excited about the subject matter and how they were addressing the concepts I was exploring and they were being well received. And, and I also felt like there was more to the conversation. So um, that, that led me to trying some new techniques in the studio and going some new directions. Um, so, okay, so deep practice. So there's a few different parts of deep practice that are important. So when somebody's sitting down to do deep practice, there's actually a story about this, um, she's like a teenager and she's, there's a videotape of her from a study that was being done about skill development. And she's, she's trying to learn this, to play this song. And what she does is she plays a couple notes and then listens inside her mind for the, how she heard it, that she wants to learn, how she wants to learn how to play this particular song. And then she plays a couple notes and goes back and plays it over and over again. And she's really honing in on just a few notes at a time. And the researchers, when they're looking at the tape, what they're saying is the six minutes that she did this, that was worth about a month of just playing, just like practice, regular practice, which is pretty cool. Like how quickly we can learn things when we go to that edge. So there's, there's a few things about what she was doing that I've taken into my own practice and I think are worth mentioning for you know, pretty much any skill you want to develop. So one is chunking it down. So it's that idea of moving really slowly and instead of, let's say I'm, I want to be better at, um, there was a while ago where I said I want to learn how to draw hands really well. So instead of just drawing hands over and over, I was, I chunked it down. So I just went to particular aspects of drawing and did those, repeated those, and then looked at what wasn't working and then went back in. So the chunking it down is very much about that playing a few notes at a time instead of just playing the whole song over and over. It's, and then notice, and then repeating it. Repeating it and knowing when one's off. Like this, when the this teenager was playing the song, she was listening and she could feel when it wasn't going where she wanted it to go. She had an ideal that she was shooting for. There was some place, some way she wanted to be playing it. So she had to be self-aware enough to know when it wasn't working. And then pull back, repeat, try it again, make mistakes along the way, try different things until it got to that point where she wanted it to go. So that's, the, you could say, it's picking a target, what to shoot for, an ideal. Um, reaching for it, practice, the doing of it, and then evaluating the gap between the target and the reaching for it, and then repeating that, and doing that over and over until um, there's a felt sense that things are starting to work better. And usually doing that daily, there's things I do daily in my practice as an artist. Um, that, that aspect of having an ideal is really important too, like having something to shoot for. Um, so there's. A lot, it's interesting, with my paintings, a lot of time it's, there's a felt sense that I'm shooting for, or there's a passage in a painting I've seen recently that I'm considering when I'm painting. Um, so it's often a combination of things for me as I'm looking. Um, so let's we'll look at a few more paintings here. Um, so. I was working on this idea of beings moving through our inner landscape, and then I started to think about this idea of the energies. Is it? Okay, thanks. <laughs> so. So I was considering um, this idea of what are the, that feeling we have when we're aware of, um, you could say the presence of the divine. I also think that that's when our ideal is present in the landscape. Like if somebody's ideal is compassion, like when they're aware that compassion is moving through the landscape, what does that feel like? What's the, the felt experience of that? So um, I started looking at the Northwest forest. I was thinking about what it means to be an, an artist in the Northwest and how I feel when I go out into nature, how I feel when I go out hiking. Um, what's, like, it's, there's, it's the air. I mean, there's, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot with the fires that have been going on too, like that, 
that clean air that's in the woods, the negative ions, and how much I've been taking for granted any sort of clean air until we had this, it was like a week of unhealthy air in the city. Um, and it's more than the clean air too, it's, this, it's like the vibrancy of life. It's, there's something going on that's more than what we can really explain um, at a physical or sense level. Um, so these are also in that conversation of this, you know, this, the felt experience of awareness of the divine presence, so the, the presence of the divine according to what that is for each of us. And um, then I started looking at, um, I, was, I was really curious about what's been going on with the bees. So that took me into this idea of um, the, like what bees are doing, like what they're offering that's about more than they're these beings that pollinate flowers. And so I got really curious about what's, what's going on with like how do they, how do they know when a flower's got the nectar, like the pollen to pick up? Like what's going on with that? So I started researching them and it's really interesting because they, um, they, there's an electrical signal that the flower will, will give off. So flowers have this electrical signal. And if a bee's been to visit a flower, that electrical signal changes. So that's when, you're, when you see bees going from flower to flower and they'll skip one and keep going. It's because one of the other bees already got there and it's, it's been tapped, it's done. It's like, so they move on to the next one. And then I got curious about, there's theories about how they see. How, so bees don't really see green. They see these colors that we don't see, like ultraviolet and, and other colors. Um, and I was also thinking of that idea of practical spirituality alongside the more kind of, I don't know, esoteric aspects. So I did a show that was about how, what can we do to practically support healthy bee populations and other pollinators as well. Mostly I was thinking about honeybees. And so this the painting over here, that was very much about there's particular plants that support bee population. And it, it's so cool that there's like these pretty easy things to do. If somebody's got room on a patio or in a yard, you, know, you can plant these certain kinds of things and, and the bees will show up. Um, so there's another one coming up. Um, and so yeah, I was, I was still thinking about that idea of the energies that are moving behind what we see and experience. Um, so both these paintings are actually about that in different ways. Um, it's something that I think a lot about in my work that we have this physical level that we're moving through life and so things that, well, physics, was, physics will say this is not actually solid matter, it's mostly space, <laughs> um, but it feels like solid matter, the, the, the stuff. And then there's also other levels. So there's, there's usually, in most traditions, at least four levels, and then there's traditions that have upwards of 12 that just keep going, stacking these. You know, there's like there's a vertical stack. So you know, you've got this physical level, and then there's the dream or subtle level that things are happening on. And dreams can feel really real, right? And then there's the causal level where, it's, where things start bubbling up. So there's cause and motion as things come into to our awareness, at least consciously. And then you could say like the ground of being. So the emergence of what's coming from whatever that place is or name we have for that. And so I, so I think about that a lot with my work. You know, those, the patterns that you see moving through are very much about that. There's these other things that are happening um, that are affecting us or supporting us or you know, inspiring us. They're there if we can catch the, the current, catch the wave of them in our awareness. And as I was thinking about these things, um, these pieces are within the last year. Um, actually, one of them I just showed at Seattle Art Museum earlier this year. I started thinking more about this idea of space, about having, um, well, being, like being in a spiritual re retreat. And we would do these meditations, and then we'd all we'd do a check-in after. Like, how was I? Where, where am I at now? Like, what, tra what transformed for me? And many times, the word space would come up. I feel more space inside. Like, you know that feeling like, of spaciousness when things are just a sense of ah, <laughs> calmness? Or, 
It's, it can be different for each of us. Um, and I got really curious about having, how to bring that into the work and offer that so that these pieces, when they're, when they're going out to their, where they're gonna go, their homes or businesses, um, that they offer this possibility of being like a world to enter into. I think paintings have that, where they're, they're kind of, in a sense, they're worlds that I'm creating on the canvas. I think that's such a cool thing about being a painter is that it's like, give me a 2D surface and some pigment with oil and a brush and I'll make this world. Like, whoa. <laughs> um, and then what can be offered if somebody's engaging with the work? So, and again, that's, that's gonna be a choice according to what what somebody's paying attention to, where somebody's at. Um, when I was younger, I got introduced to um, the work of Vincent van Gogh, or as some people say, Vincent van Gogh. And there was such a sense of um, like a nourishment, a deep nourishment when I looked at his work. And as I went on to study more art, especially in high school, I was studying a lot of art history. And I, I just, I felt like I'd go to the, some of the museums in New York and just and feel this, it was such a gift, like there was, it just felt like I'd gotten to go and eat this rich meal when I went and um, sat with these paintings and really experienced them. And I love the power of art that it has to do that for us. So I kept looking at this idea of, of spaciousness. Um, these are some of my more current work. Just had a show in Salem with these in the last, um, in the last year. Um, and again, still looking at this idea of space. And then the botanical elements, they keep showing up and I'm still seeking to understand why I'm so drawn to the botanicals. They just keep showing up, you know, like I've, I've showed you work from the last basically like 10 years and the leaves keep showing up. You know, there's, there's actually a, um, a tenant in some of the mystical teachings that says every leaf is a page of the sacred scripture that is nature. And I really like that idea that there's, you know, there's, there's things all around us that are ordinary every day. You know, leaves, I see leaves every day. And if I'm in this place of spaciousness, let's say, then there's gonna be a gift in that. Like there's you know, different shapes and what's offered there is, um, there's a lot to be said for what can be found there. Um, these are, this is also current work. I'm uh, really thinking a lot about, um, I actually did these before the forest fires. I did them in the spring. And I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, the importance of every tree and to value every tree. Um, the, they're, there's, they're all worth, worth valuing and um, having reverence for, you know, reverence for life. So um, this is the other current work. Um, so another example of art and solace. Um, I don't know if you can see it from here. Do you see who's in that? picture? <laughs> Yoda. <laughs> so, and this, I um, actually found this, it was an article in the New York Times. So this is actually, this picture was in a textbook in, um, in the Middle East. So the high school kids were opening this up and finding this in their textbook about recent history. Um, King Faisal, who was, um, he ruled Saudi Arabia for like 11 years. So this is actually the work of an artist, um, so you just get his name for you. His name is Abdullah al Shari. And this is what he does is he takes, um, he mixes pop culture icons into historic photographs. So he was looking through these photo archives from the Middle East and he said, this is a quote from him, all the pictures were really sad, you know, refugees and war. This is what the archive needs, he recalled thinking, was something fun, something that makes it less depressing. So this is, an example of actively offering solace. And then he also said, you know, like King Fazil, um, who actually outlawed slavery, spread public education, and introduced television to his country. And incidentally, there are still no public movie theaters in Saudi Arabia. Um, Whatever, women can drive. Women can drive, yeah. What, like last, this past year, or recent, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so he said, like the king, the Jedi master was known for his intelligence and was, he's popular among the Saudis, so they know who he is. And he also wore the same color ro robes and was the same color as the Saudi flag. He was wise and always strong in his speeches. 
So this is um, the, the um, artist Abdul Al Shari talking about the king, King Fazl. So I found that Yoda was the closest, closest character to the king, and also Yoda and his lightsaber, it's all green. <laughs> so, and his mom actually found this in, because she's a teacher, so she found this in a copy of a textbook and texted him, and they, they don't know how it got in the textbook. It just showed up in there. So they're, they're recalling all the books that have them. <laughs> <laughs> so art and solace, <laughs> um, so I wanted to share about that. Um, and I also, I, there was a quote at the beginning that said, some people look for a beautiful place and other people make a place beautiful. And that quote, um, when I first heard it years ago, I thought about how, you know, keeping like the, the beauty we can bring to a home or a place, like the physical beauty, and then I started thinking about that as, the place inside and making the place inside ourselves beautiful and the place inside others beautiful. So both how, I, how I'm working in the studio when I'm alone and what, how I am with the work itself, you know, both being in living at the edge of my ability and developing skill or in that place of flow, you know, co-conversation with the universe, let's say, and then also how am I being when I'm with other people and the kinds of conversations we're having bringing that sense of beauty to that, those conversations. So that said, I'd um, love to have conversation or hear questions or so open it up. Any questions? Yes? What were you doing before you decided to go back to school for art? I, um, I did a few different things. Um, I was a, um, a, window, a window designer at a record store, so I was Still doing art, but different kind of art. And they also did massage therapy for a while. So, yeah. And then how long have you been in Portland? How long have you been in Portland? Mm -hmm. um, almost 30 years. Uh, I like being here. Um, I've noticed that I, I like this as my home base. And then I like to both travel to see other places and meet artists and art appreciators in other places. And then I also like to show my work and sell my work in other places. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any um, like activities that you do before you do that to like calm you down? Like, like jogging and then they go and do something. I mean, do you have any kind of like precursors to this flow state? Yeah, that's such a good question. And also, uh, do you have any Oh, it's a flow state? Like working on whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a great question. So it's both the, um, what do I do to help bring, facilitate bringing the flow state in, and then also if the flow state shows up in other places. <clears throat> yes, I do. Um, for me, I find that it's a combination. Um, before I go into my studio, most mornings, almost every morning, I will, do some sort of physical activity, either walking or um, I just got into belly dancing. So some sort of physical, like I feel like the body's an instrument and so I've got to take care of my instrument. Like painting is weirdly physical. I, that was kind of a surprise when I got doing it full time. Um, and I think a lot of making is very physical, even if it's sitting at a table drawing. So there's something about that, like the physical exercise. And then I also do, you might say, um, you might call it an entering practice. So I'll sit down and do um, this, some focused breathing, spiritual practices to, it's to, it's both to calm down and it's also to kind of align with a different part of me and then bring that to the easel. And flow, it's so interesting because sometimes it, it'll happen really fast. It's like, where, what just happened? And then there's other days when it's just like this elusive, not gonna happen today kind of place. So it just, and there's factors that I yet to learn what those are. Um, and then as far as other activities, um, yeah, there's times when I'm doing, um, doing research and especially if it's researching for a body of work where I'll be looking at a lot of art. Um, 
and especially if it's a new body of work where I've really not, I don't have a sense of where it's going yet, so I'm kind of in a gathering state, and it's not yet shaped. And actually one of my goals is to be allowing that to happen more and more, to be more in an uncertainty instead of thinking, oh, well, now I know what this is about, so here I go, I'm gonna paint about it now, but really to keep in a kind of open-ended place, so, yeah. What about you? Do you have like, that state of flow? Have you noticed that it's certain? Uh, um, dancing sometimes, just like yeah. a group of people that are like engaging in music uh, randomly. But also, I find sometimes like when I come out of like a movie theater, I'm really calm and really focused, and following and being forced to follow a narrative for that long. If mm -hmm. I'm engaged in it, it does something weird. I've just noticed this since I was a kid. Everything is much more linear and like follows one another in actual order for a limited amount of time until I like snap out of it. Those are two just random examples, and I don't have really much control over them, or I've never exerted much control over them. But it's just really weird. You know, and then like exercise when you repeat something with the same motion. I've always been drawn to that a lot, like just repeating the same motion, and then like it slowly evolves into like where you know if you're doing work. If you do that enough, eventually you will just force it. It's like, a, it's like using a hammer to break into that flow state. So like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, it's not always that useful because by the time you're in the bar, I've nailed like 2,000 nails. I'm really good at nailing a nail. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, I don't know. Those are my examples, I guess. So, yeah. yeah, that's actually why I got into dancing was to see if I could bring that sense of practice to a physical activity and yeah. both find the flow state and the skill development. Thanks. Yeah. A <laughs> um, couple of questions. One, uh, there in the email that got sent for this evening's gathering, there was a painting which didn't show up here, and I was hoping it would because I was really drawn to it. It's uh, and I don't remember exactly the title. It was like to uh, to align yourself with people who keep the flame. This one that has very deep reds in it, and the images of the plants are very in-depth and yet very amorphous, you know, just not much of, um, not as definitive as some of these other paintings. And it just really drew me in, so uh, how do you, okay, well, number one, personally, is that painting viewable somewhere? Um, how do you, what, what inspires your choice of the color palette when you're working on any one of these paintings? And I forgot the third one, it might pop in my head, but anyway. Okay, you um, consider that, I'm gonna see if I can, this will work, right? I know what it is. You know, seek, seek those who play Excuse me, Thank you, yes, yes. yes. So, I think I can find it. Okay, I'm learning something here, a technical skill. If I yeah. pop it up on my computer, will it show up on the screen? I believe it does. Okay, let's find out. particular painting because this is, this was, um, I had talked about there was a time when I really got a little too into this, this is what I do and how I do the work and this is what shows up on the canvas and um, it got very um, kind of regimented. So this, this particular series came out of 
So I'm gonna put all that aside and I'm gonna see what happens when I just paint. So it was really welcoming the, there are no rules here, let's see what happens when I go into flow state and see what comes up from that place. So this is what came up. Um, so in reply to your question about, about you know, what colors and where I'm choosing palettes, um, I, just, I just was interviewed and, and the interviewer asked that as well and I realized that there, there are definitely places that I'm drawing from when, I'm, when palettes are showing up. Um, there's actually, I'd seen a show by a painter here in Portland and it wasn't even the whole painting, it was just this one passage and he combined these two colors on top of each other and I was like, that is so cool. And it's almost like it gets put into a file and then I take it home and eventually it shows up on the canvas and it's not usually a, I think I'll use that combination. It's, <coughs> it's just kind of, it bubbles up. Um, I also look a fair amount at different kind of cultural palettes. So like when I went to India, there's such this particular kind of palette that's there. So that keeps showing up in my work as well. And um, interesting enough, fashion can really guide my palette too. So whatever, what I'm seeing, I, I really I like looking at fashion and those color combinations can show up in my work too. The natural world. So kind of drawing from all different places, which sounds kind of general, and yet that's it's kind of like this collecting. Like a lot of artists, we're collectors. It's like, oh, there's a shape here, and there's this cool color here, and, and it all kind of gets put together on the canvas. Eventually. In some of those other paintings, there was a lot of space, literally, you know, yeah. the, the, that, the, that particular kind of depth. But in this one, it's, it's, the field is very full, and yet still there is this tremendous depth. I think yeah. that's what I love about it. It's like, it feels almost impenetrable, and yet you can see through. So I, I like that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I have been looking at some Hans Hoffman, so I think that was affecting things too. He was We're looking at what? Hans Hoffman's paintings, and he did a lot of color studies and was very interested in the bringing depth, mostly in abstract ways. But, so I'm really looking at that. And then your question about um, pattern. Yeah, I was looking. Um, I would, what I usually done is I picked a certain pattern and then it was hand done within using some drafting tools. So <clears throat> for instance, if there's a, a street a strip going across the canvas, I would put in the line of where the pattern would go and then yes, it would be freehand. Um, with the exception of the vertical beings, there's some that I was using stencil. With, yeah, but for the most part freehand, which is very meditative to do the freehand. Because talk about slow, it's like just to get it just right, really is very meditative. It's enjoyable, yeah. Okay. Yes? When you start out with, um, I guess, the idea of a piece, do you end up doing like preliminary sketches that are very detailed or are they more abstract or do you go straight out to a canvas and just kind of work it out from there? Um, I notice mostly, so either um, detailed thumbnails or, or just going on the canvas. <coughs> I usually, if I'm developing a body of work, I will do a fair amount of thumbnails and then a kind of a combination of thumbnails and then going right on the canvas. It's pretty rare that I'll do a detailed drawing of a whole painting. Sometimes I'll, I'll look at a specific um, botanical, like so I'll do some sketching about a you know, take a frond of something and sketch and see what com comes out from that. Um, and usually, um, yeah, once I get going, it's right on the canvas, yeah. And do you really like have a whole body of work planned out before you kind of start doing it? Or does one painting help influence the next one in like a series? Oh, that's such a great question. So I usually don't have a full body of work planned out. <coughs> I usually have, well, let me say it differently. I have ideas. I have kind of a set of, you might say, rules. So there's going to be some of this palette. There's going to be some of these shapes. And then as I'm painting, things happen <laughs> that are different from the plan. <laughs> mm. What's really interesting with doing whole bodies of work is that usually there's a starting point where often comes from something I've read that gets the wheels turning. And I start asking questions and then I paint about it. 
And then, and I've noticed it's usually about two years that I work on a particular body of work. So about halfway through the, this, doing a body of work, and I feel like I'm starting to get a sense of like, this is really, you might say the journalistic aspect, this concept's really getting addressed here. Then something deepens, like a whole new set of questions comes out, and it's like, okay, now, now what? <laughs> and then sometimes there'll be some changes in the paintings that start happening. So the paintings are informing each other. And then what I'm doing more now is I work on usually about 10 to 20 paintings at a time. So as I'm trying different ideas, it's happening right next to each other. Um, so, and then I also have a rule in my studio that if, I, if I'm looking at a painting and I say, I wonder what happened if I dribbled a whole bunch of purple across the whole canvas or whatever comes after, I wonder what happened if, then I have to do it. <laughs> Which usually <laughs> leads to really cool things. Not always, but sometimes. I think yeah. being willing to make bad paintings is a very good thing to do in studio practice. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. How did you <clears throat> How did you decide on oil on canvas as your as your medium? Did you travel through other things, or because you spoke to how kind of like that? The, the, I don't know the way I want to phrase it is like the magic of creating a space where there is no space. You look at two dimensions and you try to take something beyond that. And Like how, how did you decide that oil on canvas was going to be your method? Is it the way that it moves or stays or how, like what, how do you feel about it like material wise? Mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> Wait, yeah, what, how do I address it? Um, so the decision to paint with oils, um, there was a f there are a few different factors in that. Um, one is, I think because I was um, introduced to Van Gogh's work so young. But, and he's he uses or used oil so why did that happen? It's used oh, it's okay. <laughs> he uses it he just he really shows like this the gooiness and sensuality of oil. So I think that started that planted a seed right there, like oil painting, cool. And then as I I actually kind of did like in high school instead of doing oil painting, I went and did all these crafts that honed my color sense. So it was almost like I went and developed all these other skills. So when I got to oils, and it was, and it was very much that I was like, there's that, and I want to go there, and I want these other things to be in place. And then when I get to smush oil paint around the canvas, I'll have these other skills that I can bring to it. And it, it was almost like a future calling. Like physics talks about that. Like there was a seed that was planted from the future that said, this is the place for me to go. And I also, so there's this, yeah, the gooiness of oil paints and the versatility of them. Like in my work, there's sometimes people say like, what are you working with? Because they can look like pastels, they look like watercolor sometimes. I just, I like to explore how multifaceted oil is as, as a medium. And I think that's so amazing. And then the colors are just great. I just, there's also, this is kind of the more um, cerebral response that, there's something to me about stepping into the stream of history that the oil painting's been around for hundreds of years. And despite those different times in recent years where you know painting's supposed to be dead, it's, it's still got something to offer. So I like that idea of stepping into the stream of, of painting. There's like this river of history and I get to be part of that conversation by using this medium that's had so much to say and there's, there's still aspects to it. Um, that are interesting, so, yeah. Yes. So are your originals with oil really textural and they have a lot of depth or are you more flat? It varies depending on the different bodies of work. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question because I found that I'm, I'm more interested in exploring what, I, what, like what kinds of different effects I can get instead of this is always how the painting looks and how I apply the paint. Which has been a really, I kind of like that way of being an artist because there's things that'll only happen, like there's a technique I learned of putting newsprint on the painting and then pulling it up. And there's these things that'll happen with the paint that 
they'll only happen if it's a certain thickness. And then there's, you know, there's that great thing when paint's really gooey. So it's, I like to explore how different thicknesses show up, what they are, what they look like. Yeah, it's a good question. It's, yeah. To follow up to that, yeah. I thought you went somewhere really interesting. How often do you like to paint and see what the material does and where it leads you versus how much you try to control that material into shapes that you've already predetermined? Like, mm -hmm. where do you find the struggle, like kind of the, the there's a phrase I can find, but like the give and take, give and take of like yeah. how you're interacting with the actual material that you're using to create whatever. That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I find that um, the more the more I follow the I wonder what would happen if pathway, <laughs> it will often go to I wonder what happen if I mix a whole bunch of galkid light and spray it on across the whole canvas, or I wonder what happen if so there's that's where I kind I meet that. Um, might say censoring or controlling part. Um, and there is a time for that, yet I also, and it's something I've been working more with lately, is to just paint, that's one way to put it. Just see what happens. So there's, there's been some really great surprises. Like there's, there's some artists that I, uh, I looked at their work and I was like, how do they do that? And then I, I was just painting one day and, you know, I saw this thing come out under the palette knife, and I was like, that's how they did it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said for not trying to follow the a manual or, or this is always how to get this effect. Like I've been doing copies, I've got a mentor that's where we've been talking about that. And the thing I like about copies is that they're getting me to try things that um, I really, I hadn't, like, like painting a Raphael copy like how does he do the, how do those figures look so three dimensional? And when I got it, it was like this aha moment, like, oh, and part of it, I did some research and I did some just painting and kind of combined them until it kind of popped. And so I think there's a lot to be said for the just exploring aspect of paint. Like I, I like that idea of, I, I usually have at least one canvas going that's the smear paint on a canvas. So it's just like, okay, here's leftover paint, smear, smear, smear. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, I can bring that over here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good question because there is a time for, okay, this is now what I'm doing and the technique I'm using and how I'm gonna render this certain thing that's going on in the painting. Um, and yet I think to have, to strive to have a place for both is a really important part of a, a practice. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Anita? happen um, yes and yes <laughs> um, no that that's a good question because yeah there is that um, that idea that when we when we stop like forthrightly working with something then the creative process can allow for things to come in from other places so sometimes it happens in the studio and I've noticed that what what helps it happen in the studio is if I, for some reason, like sitting back from the painting, that was, we did that a lot in art school. I learned how to like look at the whole painting and look at it from a distance. So actually about as far away as, as you are. So <clears throat> if I sit back and don't really think too much about it, just look at the painting and be with the painting and breathe with the painting, sometimes the ahas will come there. Um, I also, have a practice where I, um, I kind of have a mobile studio inside. So I'm thinking about paintings as I go through my day. 
Um, if I'm traveling, sometimes I'll take pictures of what I'm working on and just open them up when I'm waiting for, you know, flight or something like that. And um, and then so sometimes those ahas will come that way. So I think the the main thing is is to not not try to figure it out. I actually just had that happen this past week where I was, I got in this figuring it out, like I gotta make this composition work and this is the way it, it just wasn't working and it was such a good reminder that it's not gonna be about how I think about it, it's gonna be about letting go of thinking I know what I'm doing <laughs> in a way and, and letting, the, it's like a conversation, like the painting's gonna tell me where to go Studio, I'm really excited to get back in the studio. <laughs> yeah, there's very much a, oh, I want to go, I want to get there. Um, when it's more of a, a struggle time, then yeah, less urgency. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think there's there's a lot to be said. I was going to talk a little bit about the creative process because I find that it's so fascinating how we do all like at least for me, I research and prepare. That's the, the Wallace model, and then there's an incubation time. And I think that's such an interesting part of creating that there's this time where there, it's space that it can't be directly entered into. There needs to be that kind of time of letting things incubate and then the ahas come out of that. And yeah, it is interesting that it happens for me both in the studio and not in the studio. But there's something about that giving it time to really bubble up like where to go. And then sometimes things don't always work either. And that's, that's part of the process too. So. Do you see your painting for the I see, um, I usually see parts. Yeah, I've noticed that there's, like I'm working on a series right now and there's um, kind of like in that deep practice way, there's an ideal of a part of the painting that I see and want to bring into being. And then, so that's what I'm shooting for in the painting. And um, I don't usually see whole paintings. I see passages. And then other times I don't, I don't see, I don't, yeah, I just, I just paint like this painting was, was there was, I'm gonna use botanicals and I'm gonna experiment with color. And then from there, these things start happening. So yeah, good question, yeah. Is it that way with when you're making physical stuff? Because it's a little different. There's like engineering parts when it's constructing things. Are you asking me now? Yeah, or anyone that you make physical like objects. I do things before I go and do them. Yeah. You gotta plan a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. But like sometimes, you know, if you're like just working with clay, you know, then you're just like, and then it's like, it's pretty like, it's, you know, or like pottery, something like pottery, you know, is just very like, um, or for me, like the act of, of putting two things together, like welding, the actual act of following the bead and like having that like moment where it's time sensitive or like throwing a pot where it's like you, you're reacting like in real time to what's happening. That can be really flowy, so it's kind of uh, both things. But like woodworking is the least flowy thing I can possibly imagine. 
That's why I don't frame my own paintings. <laughs> <laughs> but, and you still have the creative process. It's just in a different part. It's compartmentalized. Yeah. yeah. But it's in two dimensions, kind of like there's, you know, it's yeah. Yeah, it's so that's such an interesting thing that you bring up because composition, there's, there's a very um, academic rules oriented approaches to it, you know, like the, the rule of the nines on the canvas and you put, you put this here and this there and, and yet there's also this kind of mystery part to it that can't quite be taught. Like when I took composition we would do projects every week and that kept coming up like that idea of y y even overthinking it, it it won't work there has to be like this almost meeting of you know, I, I still have yet to describe it like, <laughs> like Nate, you, you know what feels good and what works in the space and yes yeah. yeah that's a thing that there that's a good way to put it like a, I, when i'm giving artist talks there's for some reason, the question, like, how do you know when a work is finished? So that, that question comes up a lot. And so it's something I've thought about because there's a very definite place when I know a piece of art is, when I know it's finished. And it's like, you, well, you said the word, harmonize. Like, everything starts harmonizing. And, and I've thought about, like, how else do I describe that? And it's like, well, that's, that's it. That, that describes it. <laughs> and I think that's such a fascinating part of art making that it's like, it just, I'll start. It's almost physical. I almost hear it, and it just comes together, and it's very satisfying. <laughs> it doesn't always happen, and not every painting works, but when it does, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Interesting that you chose the word solace uh, to head up your talk. I uh, yesterday read a piece in New York Times about Jim Carrey of all people, who in the last six years has become an artist. You know, you don't see Jim Carrey out there in the world. Yeah. He's got a studio. He's been producing um, paintings. They're not like your paintings at all. But it was very interesting reading the uh, interview because he likewise engaged in a lot of spiritual terms, but his output or his way of expressing it was any, I didn't see solace in it so much as like mania. It's like Jim Carrey, you know, doing art. <laughs> and so, <laughs> So the way in which it emerged was utterly different than what you described. So when you, when you use the word solace, I think of comfort, and I also think about um, solace as something being associated with grief or bereavement or sadness. So I'm curious yeah. about your choice of that word. I'm so glad that you're asking about that, because I was, I want, when I was considering, like, what would I want to talk about with this, um, you know, being invited to talk here, and... I, I got really curious about, well, it's something that I think about a lot in my work, which is making art that's about beauty and upliftment and goodness, not in the moral term, but in the, like, the universal, like, there is goodness here. And there's, that's not to say there's not, there, I mean, there's other things going on that are just really challenging and difficult and we live in very strange times. And so it got me thinking about how the word solace it does encapsulate both I acknowledge that there's things that are challenging right now and like can feel very there's a there's a lot of burdens that people carry around and yet there are ways that you know we can I mean, I'll speak for myself that I can show up especially to my work and um, you know, our work, our life mission isn't always about our job. Sometimes it is, but really, like, if we find something that we're really deeply loving doing, then we have a way to bring solace to ourselves and then also by doing that which we love also to, you know, more than just ourselves too, whether it's what we're offering or the way we're doing it. So, yeah, I was kind of surprised because I kept coming back to that word and I was like, that's, it's like this whole story in one word, 
that's saying both, yeah, there's things that are tough, like I just went through some tough stuff earlier this year, and then there's a remedy, so it's, it's got both in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I also was thinking, um, I was thinking about how, it, like, what if we look at how to do our work in a way that's nourishing to the deep parts of ourself and serving, that's not about trying to fix something, that's more about that pull of what we love. Like, it's coming from the other side of, rather than I'm doing this so I can feel better, it's more I'm doing this because this is what I deeply feel called to, and that's pretty cool. So, yeah, thank you for asking about that. Yeah. And Jim Carrey doing visual art, huh? <laughs> Check it out, man. It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> right. Questions, comments, anyone? Else? Right. Thank you, Curiosity Club. Thank you for for having me speak. It's been a real joy. <laughs> <laughs>